Right. Go ahead and get started here. We are recording. Thank you everyone for being here for our fourth and final webinar in our fall webinar series. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Afterwards, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and a link will be made, will be made available to those who have requested one. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Wild Ones, uh, we are um, we promote environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve, the bio, uh, preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. You can find out more about us on our website. That's wildones.org. And if you're interested in becoming a member, uh, you can go to wildones.org slash membership. You can join for as low as $25 a year. Uh, that's for those on limited income or students. Uh, we don't want... Um, income to prevent anybody from being able to join an organization. So um, the next tier above that is $40 uh, for a family consisting of uh, at most two adults and all children under 18 in a home. Uh, you can also check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Ozark Wild Ones. Uh, also, if you want more information, you want to reach out to us by email, we're at wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com. So today's webinar, we have Cody George uh, from the Thaden School is going to speak to us about um, ecological land care, uh, integrating horticulture with ecology. Cody serves as the ground manager at Thaden School, where the organically managed campus is home to native prairie plant communities and nine acres of seeded prairie. Uh, Cody has over 15 years of experience in the green industry of Arkansas with 11 years in public garden management in Northwest Arkansas. Cody holds a bachelor's degree in horticulture from the University of Arkansas and is an accredited organic land care professional. Uh, today's talk, uh, Cody is going to guide us through creating and managing beautiful ecologically functional garden spaces. Uh, participants are going to learn the importance of soil health, proper site analysis, and plant selection. Uh, organic land care management strategies will also be discussed, such as invasive weed control, sustainable mulches, lawn alternatives, and the elimination of synthetic pesticides and or herbicides. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Cody George. Cody, thank you for being here today. And I'll let you take it from here. All right. Thanks, Eric. Can everybody hear me okay? Audio sounds good? Okay, great. Pretty good. All right, great. Thanks so much. Um, well, like Eric said, um, my name is Cody George, a grounds manager at uh, Thayden School. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background um, uh, about, about Thayden School. It's an aerial shot um, from a couple, well, about early last summer. We're an independent school that serves grades uh, 6 through 12. Uh, we're located uh, about three or four blocks just south of the downtown Bentonville Square. Um, you can see our uh, landscape or our some of our landscapes. So we have an east and a west campus. This photograph just um, shows you our uh, east camp, or I'm sorry, our west campus, our main campus here, where the students. So you can see we're an open campus, um, present some wonderful um, um, uh, teaching opportunities, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, some challenges at times. So um, like I said, it's an open campus, so outside of school operating hours, uh, you know, public is um, encouraged to walk through and, and, and check out our landscape. So this is a really, really early picture of our landscape. You can see these mulched beds here. There's about 43,000 uh, landscape plugs uh, utilized in our campus. So I'll um, get a little bit more into that um, here. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> goodness. Um, our landscape features about 15 acres of uh, combined uh, bed space, um, uh, seeded prairies, and organically managed uh, turf grass. Uh, we're a 30 acre campus, so the rest of that is, um, you know, operational, um, you know, buildings, uh, hardscapes, that sort of thing. Uh, so we, uh, our, our landscape, um, look at the photograph on the left. Uh, it's a pretty good indication of the native plant communities that, um, that are displayed here. We're heavy on grasses. Uh, I should back up and say our landscape uh, was designed by um, national firm Andrew Pogon Associates, who did a really great ecological assessment of the area before they 
uh, or during the design process. So they did a really great job sort of um, um, implementing, um, you know, native uh, grasses, um, perennials, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then we also, uh, we also, so we have about 120 different plant species uh, on our site. Um, most of that being herbaceous, but we do um, have about 30 species of woody material on site. Um, we, uh, the landscape was designed to, uh, to capture and to filter excess rainwater or storm water. Photograph on the right shows um, one of our many um, rain gardens uh, that we have. And we also use permeable features to help to filter the water down um, slowly. A um, few pictures of our uh, prairies here. Our prairies are pretty unique. So, um, so they sort of flank the campus on the north side and the south sides. So and we have small sort of prairie fragments scattered throughout campus. Um, I mean, some of these range in odd shapes from 50 square feet uh, up to about two and a half or three acres. Um, I manage these differently um, based on ecological needs. Some of the larger fragments, like the one uh, to the left here that shows the house with the Indian blanket blooming, uh, that's about a, a four acre um, plot right there. Um, try to manage those areas uh, to be grassland. So to sort of take our campus back 250 years ago prior to establishment um, when the Osage Prairie was dominant and uh, managing these uh, to be grasslands um, to attract grassland bird species. Um, and then some of the areas um, here, the, the photograph on the right with the green, um, the green building, that's uh, annual ryegrass that I use for a covered crop that I'll talk about um, soon, but um, it's mixed in there with um, uh, American basket flowers, a wonderful um, native annual. Um, and so this area is managed more for pollinators. So um, not so much heavier on the grasses here, more on the flowering species. So um, quite a bit, um, quite a bit, not so complicated as it is um, uh, just different management um, styles. So my management, my garden management style um, focuses more on sustainability and um, just organically managed uh, uh, garden spaces. So today we want to um, talk about uh, integrating horticulture with ecology, um, horticulture being the art of garden cultivation and management. Um, you know, by definition, my son here holding very proudly that patch of moss in his hand. I mean, he's a horticulturist. These students here working in our student garden, they're horticulturists. We're horticulturists if we play in the garden and we cultivate uh, plants and grow them and propagate them um, and manage these spaces. And then ecology, the study of these organisms and how they interact with the environment around them. Um, so we have this uh, photograph with a very odd looking horticulturist here paired up with a really um, brilliant um, man um, that was unfortunately we lost him a few years ago, Dr. Lincoln Brower, who um, he was a monarch biologist. Um, he was instrumental in um, sort of, um, uh, he was instrumental in understanding the relationship between milkweed and monarch butterflies. And so through his studies as a biologist, ecologist, entomologist, um, we are understanding that milkweed is crucial for the monarchs. Um, and through him and through Dr. Chip Taylor and other, others like them, this migration is being um, you know, managed correctly and we're addressing these issues, um, which is exciting. Uh, because it allows, you know, my son here holding uh, a monarch butterfly. We have a sort of a little monarch observatory uh, back behind him there in our garden where we put a, um, a little enclosure around so we can watch the monarchs um, 
go through their metamorphosis, which is pretty, pretty incredible. By the way, if any of you have young children, um, monarchs make really good pets because they're very, very quick to fly away and you don't have to take care of them. So as soon as they um, hatch out of their chrysalis, um, my son gave this one a name. He named it Branch and Branch flew away in about a day. So that was less, uh, le less vet bills on, on uh, his mom and dad. Uh, so we can, um, anyway, so horticulture and ecology sort of serves this natural partnership. So how we garden really directly impacts the relationships of uh, living organisms in their environments. Here's a good example, um, the photograph on the left with the red arrow. This is an area to the south of our campus where it's a lot of segmented uh, prairies. Um, I'd like to make sure that those prairies um, have a sort of a mown strip just to give it a little bit of a formality to it and to keep some of the taller species from encroaching onto the sidewalk. Um, there was a black willow. There's some larger black willows um, across campus, um, not planted, um, but it's a wonderful tree, uh, a good host plant. Um, and so I was going to cut it down just so I can keep a formality. But then I started observing all these little Viceroy um, caterpillars on it, which was really exciting. Um, and then you can see the Viceroy uh, butterfly on the far right. Um, of course, the Viceroy, it's known as sort of this master of mimicry, the caterpillars looking uh, you know, to a bird uh, may perhaps look like uh, bird droppings from a distance. Um, and then the uh, Viceroy butterfly itself, uh, you know, appears to be a monarch, which many birds, if they try to eat a monarch, um, notice its coloration and its patterns, uh, take a bite out of it and realize that it's uh, not too palatable and poisonous and throws it up. Well, now it's going to associate any uh, Viceroy's and the coloration. So it looks quite similar if we go back uh, to the monarch there and to the viceroy, you can obviously see the similarities. So had I removed um, this particular um, sapling of a black willow, just self-seeding, um, you know, it would have had an, an immediate impact on, um, uh, you know, this population of viceroy. Um, so I've never really seen a whole lot of viceroys before. Um, you know, you see them fluttering by here and there, but, um, it was really wonderful to see uh, about a dozen little caterpillars and uh, you know the butterflies flying around. So, um, so that sort of gets us into um, uh, organic land care. And so, um, like Eric went over the synopsis there, I really want to talk about our landscapes and how you know we put so much effort into choosing the right plants. We put so much effort into designing and we become artists in the garden. Um, we really want to make sure that we now have these native plants or we'll say non-aggressive, non-aggressive, non-native plants. Um, we want to manage those correctly so we can benefit other, uh, you know, our ecosystems not only uh, at our house or the businesses where we work, or if you're a landscaper, um, or in my case, uh, you know, a grounds manager, um, making sure that we are, um, you know, displaying good methods. And sort of the first, um, the first rule, if you want, is, is um, do no harm. Um, and that applies directly into what we do um, as, as gardeners. So um, we wanna minimize land alteration. Obviously this is large scale here. This is taken down um, 102 in Bentonville going out towards Centerton. Um, two years ago, <clears throat> the photograph on the left was a really beautiful natural wetland, prairie, a lot of swamp milkweed. Um, it was just really nice to drive by and to see that preserve. Well, a mini storage um, sort of popped up there. And so in, instead of keeping the natural wetland here, I guess for as aesthetic purposes, so people could see, I'm not for sure why, but 
they just went ahead and sawed it over all of it and then replaced instead of replacing um, their landscape back with indigenous material we have nandina which if you um, know anything about nandina or listen to dr don steinkraus's talk last week you know the harm that nandina berries can have on birds um, so it's pretty pretty sad and, and over here right almost right across the street by the way down 102 there's like 10 storage facilities it's strange um, sort of how much stuff we have I guess to, to put in there but um, we have a, a you know a tire service facility that uh, <clears throat> my son and I actually stopped several times this used to be a nice vernal pool and it would have leopard frogs and and um, you know just different um, wildlife in there and seeing um, and, and you know and seeing that now it, it's, it's kind of sad so this land alteration, whether it's large scale like this or whether it's small scale for building, you know, a landscape for a client, really want to, you know, there's this, there's this idea called bulldozer mentality of, um, well, just, you know, if there's a problem, we'll just bring a bulldozer in there and just get rid of it all and start back up. But that's not a great mentality to have as you know, we are doing serious, serious ecological harm by all, land alteration. Um, you know, again, it could be something small, like a, like a 1500 square foot garden at our home uh, and, or, or something like this. So um, uh, there's an interesting statistic that I found where, um, from the conservation science partners that say from 2001 to 2017, 9 million acres of natural area of US and the Southern states were developed in another 7.7 uh, .7 million acres in the Midwest. So losing a pretty good amount of, um, of land, of, of, of nature. Um, and so I understand that uh, expansion is, you know, it, it's, um, it's obvious, it's happening around us and it's hard to slow it down, but how we manage these properties and how we design them, we surely can, can manage. So uh, minimize tillage. You know, there's a lot of um, a lot of different opinions on on tilling, um, but there there are some you know some instances where it's it's okay to do, um, but we just want to minimize it. Um, by doing so, we're disrupting the soil food web. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard, but um, you know a, a teaspoon. They say a teaspoon of fertile soil. Um, has more organisms living in it than all the humans in the world. So, um, you know, obviously that's that's pretty micro, but it's what's making up a you know a healthy soil food web. I'll talk a little bit more about um, one of the main um, uh, you know cons, if you will, of, of tillage is exposing weed seeds. There's a, a photograph here. Um, that you know, we didn't necessarily till this area, but the soil that was used for um, was from Thaden was used on, on the soil that was on site. Um, and so, by you know, it's the simple act of moving soil from point A to point B, you are exposing you know potentially millions of weed seeds. Um, and so, you know, we've got uh, crabgrass, we've got sand mat, we got horse uh, weed here. Uh, and, and so it's just something to, to be aware of that that's what we're doing. Plus it's releasing um, stored carbon in the soil as, as, and releasing it as carbon dioxide, which is a bad thing. So uh, reducing overall input. So an input um, is anything that's off site and you're bringing into your um, uh, site. Um, you know, that can be anything from shipping plants from half across the country to operating gas powered equipment. Um, so a big one that I see a lot is, is unnecessary gas powered equipment. I use gas powered equipment. I try to do it very cautiously and sparingly and, um, excuse me, and uh, you know, we're, we are investing in battery powered equipment here at Thaden. However, um, you know, most of this gas powered equipment is unregulated. So it's just shooting out um, CO2 emissions. So by avoiding unnecessary gas powered equipment, we're just reducing that, which is great. So buying local, 
um, source on-site materials if possible, um, sustainable mulches, which we'll talk about more, or rock and boulder, um, you know, stone is such a, um, an interesting uh, way to, you know, or interesting aspects of, of a garden and it produces so many opportunities in a garden, you know, but we got to start thinking about how that's being sourced, you know, uh, rocks just aren't going to, you know, pop up uh, the next, although if you live in Bella Vista, it does seem like it pops up um, as they heave each year, but and uh, the boulders, um, we just, just something to keep in mind. Um, if you can maybe find something on, on your site rather than trucking them out and um, altering the land for them is, is something else. Change the mow and blow mindset. So in the horticulture industry, especially the landscape industry, you may hear the term mow and blow. That's somebody who's got to pick up a truck with a blower and a mower. They show up and they mow and blow your yard, trim your hedges for 70 bucks and get out there as quick as they can to go uh, to someone else. So we need, to, we need to change that mindset. We need to have pride in our work. We need to slow down. We need to start um, questioning what we're doing. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, one thing about that too is we are, we, I've observed that other people are observing that and thinking that that's the best way to do it. And so I need to do that at home. Um, and then you are seeing your neighbor do that. And so you're just copying your neighbor, um, but just keep in mind that your neighbor is probably wrong on that. And then the elimination of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, um, that's, that's pretty obvious. I'll talk a little bit more about that and what that does. Um, I will say that um, there are, you know, the exceptions to, to this. Um, it's called rescue treatments, um, plants or plant material or trees or whatever um, that have, you know, cultural significance, historical significance, um, monetary significance. Um, you want, you do want to protect your investment, um, but, um, you know, most of this lawn, um, fertilizer, pesticides, that sort of stuff um, can be eliminated. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but I won't go in depth too much, but um, anyway, so uh, site analysis. Um, <clears throat> so we wanna uh, understand through observation. So we wanna observe the key elements of a site, understand how those elements uh, will affect the organisms uh, on the site. So I'll give you a few of the key elements here. Um, so this is, I mean, this is helpful for anybody who gardens, um, um, especially if you are a landscape designer, uh, landscape architect, horticulturist, or just doing any work around your house. Um, it's, it's, a good, um, it's a good thing to just stop and to observe. So physical elements being stuff like the topography, um, the hydrology or how, or how water is moving through the, you know, this property and the soil. The photograph on the left shows a really, really steep, it's kind of hard to tell, maybe not, but uh, it's off of Walton Bull, North Walton Boulevard um, in Bentonville, but it's a very, very steep lawn. And that's simply what it is, it's just a lawn. Um, so that's, that's, you know, pretty good indication that your water is moving pretty fast. You have the lawn, then you have concrete right there. And I know Eric can elaborate a lot more on the movement of water and the effects that it has, um, especially negative effects. But keep in mind that um, grass or a turf lawn is not, does not absorb a lot of water. Um, it's about, it absorbs about 15% of excess storm water or surface water um, running down a side. So it's not the best. Um, hydrology, um, I'm sorry, this, the, the soil, so the topography, hydrology sort of go um, hand in hand. And here we got the soil. And this is, this is taken from my, my house that we bought last summer. And um, I live in Bella Vista and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on there, but um, you can see the pea gravel, 
So the entire front yard is about 1500 square feet. Um, I got a six year old son, he likes to run. So we wanted to convert that a little bit into some playable area and also a, um, a garden space. I had no idea what was underneath that. So it's about four inches of this pea gravel, hit black plastic. By the way, this was put in about 25 years ago. And I mean, the, the black plastic was as tough as they put it down. Um, and then underneath it was just this um, compacted native soil. So um, not, uh, not the best soil. Uh, however, there are plants that um, have survived quite well in there. Just knowing um, what the soil is is so important. Um, you know, these things, um, those elements are key into plant selection. So one thing I'll say about plant selection is increasing plant diversity. Um, you know, um, here's a, if you, Chris Heltzer is a really, uh, he's got a, a great uh, blog called the Prairie Ecologist out of Nebraska, it works for Nature Conservancy, I believe, but um, this is his image here and shows the importance of plant diversity because you get a sort of a, a diversity of uh, root systems. So if you're gardening on a slope, I mean, you want to hold that soil in. Best way to do that is, is um, planting different species of plants and trees and shrubs and perennials and, and grasses, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, a good example is um, uh, mountain mint. So don't really see the mint too much, but you can see around the irrigation head here, the, the reddish um, stolons of this mountain mint and how tenacious these root systems are. Um, here's just a, a quick video of, um, you know, the, the mountain mint, uh, it has great root systems, but my goodness, look at all the pollinators on these uh, on this plant. So, a really great one to, to have it, you know, in really any landscape, unless you got deep shade. <clears throat> okay, so um, existing organisms, uh, plants, animals, insects, you know, basically anything that's on on your site. Um, here we've got a picture from the Wachita Mountains. Went there this summer, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, but we need to consider all layers of, veg of vegetation, the canopy, the understory, and then of course the herbaceous layer. This was a really, really healthy ecosystem, had great uh, plant material, a lot of carex, uh, a lot of sedges, uh, a lot of hepatica and trillium, golden seal, that sort of thing. So it was a really healthy forest. Um, uh, but it but it gives you an idea of what's growing there, what is surviving. Um, I'll also notice look how look at the how close these trees are. You know we have this uh, you know I, I guess a mentality in landscaping that we have to have twenty five or thirty foot centers on plants. But if man if we're really trying to hold in the soil. Um, you know, sloped uh, soil, which this is on here. Um, you know, we need to have these communities uh, of, of plants. But anyway, um, I, I digress from that. But, uh, you know, what is the compatibility of the plants with the site? <clears throat> are you seeing any plant stress? You know, any, are your trees chlorotic? Um, you know, do you have canopy dieback in your trees? Are your plants super thin? What are the invasive species? That's a big one. Um, you know, do you have a lot of Japanese honeysuckle? That's something to consider too, because you might have to plant something um, equally um, aggressive as it, uh, but that can be controlled much better. And I'll talk about that too. But also, you know, wildlife habitat, tree snags. Here's a uh, a tree snag. So that's just a dead tree, um, usually from natural causes, um, uh, that incorporate a, a landscape. Now, they are, they're great, you know, uh, owls and, you know, insects and pileated woodpeckers, you'll, you'll just have a, a whole slew of um, uh, biodiversity, you know, but I understand the, you don't really want it if it's right up against your house. So, Obviously, if this has no um, negative effect on falling on any structure or a house or a car or your children, 
um, you know, they're, they're great to keep. Um, when I was at Crystal uh, Bridges, um, you know, we made an effort to make sure we kept snags in, in the woods as long as they did not pose a threat to, um, you know, hitting anyone or any uh, structure. So um, something to think about. Um, insect damage, you know, monitor that. Check out your tree leaves. Check out your herbaceous leaves. Some of them are obvious that they are beneficial. You know, here's a common milkweed with, with um, uh, the monarch caterpillars on it. Um, pretty obvious one there. This one, not so much. This is, when I came across this, I didn't know what it was and to what degree that, you know, these will uh, pose um, to this tree. So um, after some research, it's definitely a leaf slug, uh, it's kind of hard to say, leaf slug, sawfly. Um, not the most attractive caterpillars. Um, they're skeletonizers, excuse me, obviously. Um, however, they're not going to kill out this black gum. Um, they provide, uh, you know, forage for, for bird species, for their, uh, for their, you know, clutches of chicks. So um, I just left it. Um, and year after year, they would do the same thing. Pretty minimal um, percentage wise, it was only, you know, 10% of the tree, something like that. Um, so, I mean, just rebounded every year, still had great fall color. These, the one that had been skeletonized typically would, um, would fall off. So uh, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, so I encourage you to research it. If you don't know what it is, don't assume that it's, you know, an emerald ash borer or something and you just, you know, we have to break out the big guns to kill it. So, um, so yeah, so, so insect damage and uh, cultural elements. Uh, like I said, or I'm, I was talking with Eric before this, so maybe I said it to him, I didn't say it earlier, um, but our, the uh, landscape architects for Thaden, um, they did a really great ecological assessment of the area. Um, and through um, when I started and, and was reading this assessment, it, it turned me on to um, uh, Tom Foti, who had worked at the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission and his publications on the different ecoregions of Arkansas. And, and you could take a really cool deep dive into that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, if you are interested, look up the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission and check out their publications um, tab on their site. It's really wonderful. Um, but through his work and through this assessment, um, I, I, I was not aware uh, until, you know, two years ago that um, this, you know, Thaden and this area of Bentonville uh, was encompassed by, you know, this 10,000 acre plus prairie called the Osage Prairie, um, you know, a sort of a tall grass meets short grass um, prairie. Um, this, this particular picture here is from Surlis Prairie in Rogers off 102. Um, it is absolutely beautiful. I think the Heritage Commission does the prescribed burns on it. They do a great job. It features prairie mounds, which is why we have a lot of prairie mounds on our campus, um, man-made prairie mounds to sort of mimic that. Um, but it's just a 12 and a half acre remnant. But you drive up and down 102, you see a lot of these different remnants. Some of this stuff is for sale. If you have the means, please buy it and preserve it. But um, so anyway, so knowing your, your land history can just, can be um, really beneficial in, in your plant selection and, and, and how you manage your, your, your landscapes. And again, for your site analysis with your um, landscape architects and designers and, and that good stuff. So, um, you know, what's, what, what are you going to use this landscape for, especially if you're, you know, you're doing it for a client. Um, we know that we want to use our landscape, obviously, for educational purposes here. So we do tours and um, I had a really great um, tour with, with some students and um, half of them were terrified of insects when they started. And by the end of it, you know, we had um, students, you know, holding monarch caterpillars very gingerly. Um, they, uh, oops, they uh, uh, were, were 
gingerly petting uh, bumblebees that were nectaring. And um, so it's a really fun use, um, you know, if, if that's an element that you want to, uh, uh, to move your landscape uh, forward with. Uh, and then something obvious too is, is like utilities. Um, you know, you know, I would really recommend calling before you dig, especially if it's something, something pretty large. So eight one one is is pretty critical. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, soil health um, is sort of the basis of organic land care. Um, these slides um, are really just just beneficial slides for you. Um, there's benefits of the soil food web. So protective layer around roots, assist in nutrient root absorption, breaks down toxic components, improves disease suppression and builds soil structure. And then the components, organic matter, uh, different microbes, gas or air, plants or roots, and then any percentage of sand, silt or clay. Could not stress more the importance of soil tests or in soil samples before you, uh, if you got a big project, it, I mean, it is 100% necessary. You've got to know what your soil is. is. Um, if you are, <clears throat> um, you know, even on, on, a, on a small scale, it, it's quite important, but especially if you are adding amendments, whether that's compost, which compost tend to be high in phosphorus, and that's really, phosphorus isn't really a nutrient that we want to have uh, a, uh, a high percentage in, in our, um, in our uh, you know, waterways. So we need to be cautious on that. And so with the soil test, it's gonna give you your, you know, typically what I'm looking for is the soil pH, soil texture and NPK. You can really take a deep dive in these soil tests and which is very helpful too, but, um, and that's going to help you, you know, if you need to amend something, if something doesn't look great, um, these are very beneficial. The, the, the picture on the bottom, um, it's like a sort of an office park in Bentonville and they got a really great um, native landscape. And they have this strip of blueberries that uh, granted this is, uh, this was taken last week, it's fall. Um, However, they look like this in, in the summer as well. So a lot of dieback on them. And after just digging around in there and, and, you know, it's very heavy soil, I would seriously doubt the soil pH um, is, is high enough <clears throat> or low enough uh, for blueberries. Um, the texture was just off. So uh, it's just going to assist, assist you in the success. Um, you know, by having good soil, we're gonna have better plants. Um, building healthy soil. So something to think about is you want to feed, to, th to think what we're doing, we want to feed the soil and not the plants. Healthy soil will feed the plants. So building healthy soil, decompose or shredded leaves where appropriate. Um, local compost, make sure, you know, get a compost analysis or a bio essay of the compost. Make sure there's no biosolids in them. Biosolids, Biosolids tend to be really high in heavy metals, something we don't want leaching. Um, compost tea, worm casting teas, humate, cover crops, um, big fan of cover crops. Um, uh, reduction of mechanical disturbance, like we talked about the tilling, eroded tilling, elimination of chemical um, disturbance, synthetic uh, fertilizers, um, and then elimination of biological disturbance soon synthetic pesticides. So, um, you know, the, chem, the synthetic fertilizers, um, they're really gonna feed the soil and not, you know, they're, they're feeding the plant, not the soil. Um, the production consumes fossil fuels, they leach into soil layers, and really it um, disrupts the, the, the soil ecosystem, um, especially if you're using pesticides. So we talked about how rich soil can be, um, and um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're preserving that richness, that we're not using stuff you know, willy-nilly you know, without a soil test. If you're putting on some, you know, something that has an NPK or you're putting down some sort of other amendment, um, you're, you're simply just guessing. Um, 
you don't really know, you know, we're throwing around Osmocode all day long. Um, it's, it's not the best thing. So we want to make sure that we're being mindful of what we're putting down. And, and here I am talking about an elimination. Um, however, I realize that a lot of these ideas <clears throat> can get overwhelming. I sure, I certainly did, um, uh, can get quite overwhelming. So, you know, if it needs to be a transition period, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of great information on how to transition from a synthetic, you know, we'll say a synthetic lawn on to an organic lawn. All right, <clears throat> take a drink real quick. This is the first webinar I've given, so it's strange not hearing any, um, any feedback or anybody coughing. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully I'm still not talking to myself anymore. All right, so invasive um, weed control. So, I'm a realist um, and big picture for me is that invasive plants are here to stay. There's really been no research. There's been no um, positive publications, at least that I could find that say we're doing a very good job controlling invasive plants. <clears throat> They'll be gone in the next 10 or 20 years. When there are plants such as Japanese honeysuckle, calorie pear, uh, kudzu, um, that are, well, kudzu is not necessarily sold in stores, but I know Japanese honeysuckle and calorie pear are still sold in stores. It is upsetting to see that. It's disappointing to see that knowing the ecological damage that they have um, produced. Um, however, they're still being sold. So that's telling me that, that invasive plants are here to stay. Um, um, quick fact from the USDA, um, 133, uh, their estimates are 133 million acres of nature uh, has been lost to invasives at a rate of 1.7 million acres each year. And it costs the US government $13 billion each year for control. Keep in mind that a lot of these invasives are still sold in stores. Um, <clears throat> now with the kudzu, um, I found a really interesting article we was here, and I'm from the northeast part of the state where you do see this a lot. I know there's some down 62 going down towards Eureka and down Pumpkin Holler and Bentonville. I've seen it. So, um, but um, it, you know, it's some people say it's you know the, the plant that ate the South. But it's interesting the USDA or the, I'm sorry the US Forest Service did a study and found that kudzu only covers about 227,000 acres, which is not great by any means, but it, it, that's not as much as I would assume. However, <clears throat> the plant here on the right, the red arrow is pointing to, it's Japanese privet. Again, another one that is still sold in stores and people love it. Um, it occupies about 3.2 million acres. So quite a bit difference from, from kudzu to Japanese privet. If you walk, I mean, this was, taken um, uh, on our bike trail here at Thaden, um, right along a, a wood's edge, and it's plenty of uh, Japanese privet. All, you can see the blueberries here, um, probably the biggest cause of why it does get distributed. Um, now, <clears throat> and then of course, uh, uh, I don't know if anybody else, but I, I sure do. Um, I fight uh, Chinese um, uh, elm or lace bark elm. Um, I'm, hold, I'm holding a, a bunch of it here that I've been weeding out. You can see way in the distance here, I don't know if you can see my cursor at all, but way in the distance uh, across the, uh, the path is, um, uh, that's where the, the city planted these trees. Um, so these are not, shouldn't be my problem, but they are. Um, I not only find them across the street, but I find them across campus. So the, you know, the little uh, winged pods, um, it is extremely windy on, on our campus and they get distributed um, very easily. So now that being said, um, <clears throat> uh, we, we do uh, as gardeners, as landscapers, um, especially business owners or landscape managers, we have the, um, 
you know, we, we have the knowledge and, and, and we, we have the desire and we can protect and enhance these, these native plant communities and plant insect relationships and wildlife habitat pretty much where, wherever we want to. Um, so that's sort of the silver lining is, although in my mind, we invasive plants are here to stay, we can use these other elements um, of organic land care, ecological land care, whatever you want to call it, to help combat um, the damage and the amount of nature that we're being lost. So we no, we know that invasives are growing everywhere. Um, so why not do something where we can? Um, so um, for invasive plants, um, a little bit of a background with them. They establish and grow rapidly. Uh, Don Steinkraus went over this in great detail last week, but um, uh, most spread by fragments as well as by seeds, ability to spread over wild, wide distances, and they lack natural control, control by insects. Um, now, however, if we understand and identify what invasive we are fighting, it helps, uh, it helps to know its biological or its biology and its life cycle. Here we have yellow nut sedge. Um, that's uh, one that um, I have fought probably the most here at Thaden School. Um, but most plants are going to have an Achilles heel to them. They're going to have something that um, you can expose and you can attack that and it helps to decrease it. So on the bottom picture, this is a little rain garden that I just didn't have time and uh, didn't lose it. I came back and weeded it, but um, it's almost all nut sedge here. Um, nut sedge loves moist areas. Here you see its seeds. Um, however, if you cut off irrigation, um, if you let it dry out, um, that's the best source of uh, means to it. So simply by knowing that it likes, likes moist conditions, uh, that's its uh, Achilles heel. That's, its, um, that's how you attack it. And you can see here, um, now we had a really wet spring. I really didn't irrigate much, but after the drought actually did help me a little bit. Um, you can see it turning brown. I use sand mat, which is just a euphorbia um, to, to help fight it off too, to help starve it from nutrients. Control methods. Um, so, <clears throat> as um, if there are any landscape contractors or designers um, listening, um, and even homeowners, repeated applications of any of these is critical. Um, you know, organic herbicides, I've found a, a great concoction that, that works well, but I do have to come back every two weeks and hit it. If it greens back up, you're starting over again. Um, we really need to lose this conventional mindset of, we'll just use glyphosate and everything. Uh, you, you know, it's not gonna have that much of a, of a um, effect, uh, at least on the environment. Um, we need to lose that mentality. We need to say, okay, we're gardeners. Um, we can, you know, we can handle this. Um, we have the knowledge, we've looked up the weeds. Now let's try these different methods. So. Um, simple elbow grease is, is great. It's what I go to about half of the time. Um, there are downsides to that, you know, if you're not pulling it up from the roots. Um, simply by pulling it up from the roots, you are exposing weed seeds to sunlight. So make sure as soon as you're done, you're tamping it, you know, you're tapping that, that exposed soil down with your foot. Um, I like to run a torch uh, over it. If, if I weed out a big area and I'm getting ready to plant, um, I'll run a uh, 500,000 BTU torch over it um, several times. Solarization, putting black plastic over, um, um, or some people say clear, but um, uh, over an area and simply smothering it out. Organic herbicides are great. I have a slide of that if you're interested. Flame application. I mentioned the um, I mentioned the, uh, the 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 weed torch, the weed dragon, prescribed fires in there. Girdling. So we talked about snags. Um, if you have a tree of heaven or a, a a Bradford pear, which I have in my backyard, I took a chainsaw and I girdled girdled it 
um, three or four times to cut off any nutrients. Um, and I'm just going to let it die. And hopefully um, it's not, it's not too close to my house, but um, hopefully animals will, um, you know, insects and animals will invade it. Repeated cutting, especially in woody material. So um, that, what that's doing is just drawing down root reserves um, or the root energy reserves rather. Um, and <clears throat> if we're doing a, a, a big area from scratch, basically, make sure, I'm, ooh, need to hurry up. Um, we want to, um, we want to uh, keep cutting it down. I did that with nut sedge and it, it's wonderful, but we, um, anyway, uh, we really want to think of things in a really bad circumstance. We need to come up with like a five-year management plan. Um, take the time, try different applications, knowing the, the life cycle is, is, and timing is critical. I love volunteer days, pulling out oriental bittersweet and ligustrum or, or, um, or privet. Um, however, if we're doing that in the fall, we're just, we're just planting the seeds everywhere. We're planting hundreds more. So think about that. So we want to prune immediately. Uh, after the flowers begin to fade and the fruit just never sets. Fill voids immediately. Fill it with six inches of mulch or use a cover crop or a smother crop like buckwheat or annual rye. Um, seed it heavily and uh, let that annual, um, you know, the annual rye or the buckwheat or whatever you have um, that you can take down with mowing one time and then it just dies. Um, and then obviously using native plants. If you have, you know, a thousand square feet of honeysuckle you just took out, you know, mulch it and or, or cover it or, or, or use any of these, but um, it can be done and it, I, I, I do it every day. So um, here are a few visuals here. This is the smother crop or cover crop area. This is the area I don't really have a lot of time to, to come back to every week. So I seeded it with a clover mix and um, annual rye and you can see it up here too. It was really, really thin with I, um, uh, Virginia wild rye. It was all that was in there and it gets very weedy. You can see the torch here. Um, you can see, uh, here's what I use, uh, Avenger, green, uh, green gobbler. This is just 20% horticulture vinegar, not edible, so please don't use it. Uh, the Avenger is, um, uh, it's just uh, cit citrus oil. When I use it, it smells like oranges. When I use the vinegar, it smells like I'm, we've been pickling, uh, you know, cucumbers all day. The Dawn or the, the dish detergent is a surfactant. Uh, just a visual, everybody loves fire. So um, to see, uh, you know, we use fire as um, invasive species um, uh, suppression. It's great to come back and follow that back up after it starts um, re-sprouting to get a sort of a live growth uh, burn on it to help the sap cook out the plant. Um, okay, sustainable mulches. I, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try to get through this a little bit quicker. Um, temporary, uh, so anyway, so sus sustainable mulches, I'm gonna move on. Um, what, uh, a good here's a good definition: it's a temporary substitute for vegetation used to protect um, protect soil, retain moisture, and control weeds while adding organic matter used to improve soil conditions. That should be what mulch is. Um, that's what we use. That's how we use it here. So we used it for all those uh, um, reasons uh, at Thaden one time. Uh, used it once last year or after a bed is uh, put in. Um, I've got a standard that we just use it one time. Um, this was taken, I don't know, I think it was like um, early May, I think it was like May 1st. And then I took this one just a couple of weeks ago. These are landscape plugs, so not very big. Um, and then you know, I'm using the plants as, as essentially the mulch uh, here. So it grows up pretty, pretty fast. Um, but for some reason we got in somewhere along the way, I don't know who started it, but 
we started using mulch really, really poorly. So we use it um, as an aesthetic, which in my mind, it, it really doesn't need to be an aesthetic. Um, it's a money pit. Um, here, a, a restaurant, everybody knows volcano mulching. This is pretty quint, um, you know, the typical shot of a volcano mulch. It's at least 14 inches high up on the trunk here. Um, we all know the, the downsides of volcano mulching. I won't go necessarily through it. Um, however, landscapers typically charge by the yard of mulch. So probably why it started so someone can make a quick buck. Please don't do that. Uh, the picture in the middle is red dyed mulch. People use this for an aesthetic. I don't know why. Um, I guess it contrasts really well with the Stella de Ora lilies there, but it's also leaching onto the concrete. Um, it's dyed, usually red mulch is dyed with iron oxide at high percentages that starts to um, uh, kill out the soil microorganisms underneath it. And here's black mulch typically dyed using a carbon source. Um, Again, the black mulch, um, this garden is beautiful enough. It doesn't need black mulch as a, as a, uh, a, a visual you know, aesthetic. Instead, use the leaves for that. Um, types of sustainable mulches, wood chips, um, preferably on-site wood chips. Um, uh, if you use wood mulch, make sure you, you, you check it out, make sure it's not like cypress, um, which typically is, is done, harvesting is done. Um, um, you're eliminating ecosystems by, by doing that. Um, make sure you don't have any, uh, what's called demolition debris or construction debris. It typically has like treated wood. I found nails and stuff before. Compost, um, pine straw or some pine straw here um, or uh, nature's mulches. So um, observe nature and mimic the conditions there. Um, it's a picture of, not a great picture, sorry, but of Searless Prairie and Rogers that we talked about earlier and Crystal Bridges in Bentonville, um, both beautiful places. Um, here we have a prairie, here we have a forest and mimicking those conditions. So. Uh, my material uh, was simply too small last year. I took a picture, it really wasn't that immediate. Um, so we use a flail mower here to cut back our herbaceous material um, or a mulching mower would do just the same. Lurie Garden in downtown Chicago does a great job using that flail mower or mulching mower just to cut back the herbaceous debris. So they're not using any you know, shredded hardwood mulch, anything dyed hardwood mulch. Um, and they, you, they even leave some areas that are flagged out here higher. So, you know, nesting bees still have habitat. Shredded leaf mulch, it's great if you have forested conditions. Uh, you know, there's this great idea of, you know, to leave the leaves. Not in every condition is that beneficial. Um, in a prairie, it would choke out, it would smother a prairie. Um, you know, if you have a bed of you know, whatever, cone flower and um, black-eyed Susans, probably not, and little blue stem, probably not the best to, to put uh, leaf mulch on it as it didn't evolve, those species didn't evolve with leaf mulch. It's going to, they, uh, they evolved with more of a lean soil and not so much of a soil that's, that's uh, rich in organic matter. How about using plants as mulch, not even using anything, um, using golden ragwort, um, here, uh, sun or shade, seeds like crazy, beautiful um, yellow colors here. Um, I, I love Carex, I love most species of Carex. It grows in very thickly when it's happy, um, looks beautiful. This is just a screenshot from a video I took where it's real windy. Typically doesn't just lay over like that, but really, really pretty. Lawn alternatives, um, the great American lawn. So some st statistics here. Uh, 63,000 acres, uh, irrigated acres at that. So it makes uh, number one irrigated crop. Uh, lawn mowers uh, release anywhere from 16 to 41 billion pounds of CO2 each year. Um, 90 million pounds of fertilizer and 78 million pounds of pesticides annually. And according to National Cancer Institute, children and households that have 
home lawn uh, or homes that are lawns that are treated have a six and a half time greater risk of developing leukemia, let alone some species of dogs um, um, have a much higher chance in, in getting leukemia. Um, so um, very, um, it's not necessary as turf grasses sort of genetic predisposition uh, is to grow tall, to flower and set seed and go dormant in the summer when it's hot and dry. We are not allowing that, we're not allowing it. Um, so there's ways to eliminate that. Uh, here in Bella Vista, we got the great Bella Vista rock lawn. So not sure where this started, but uh, you talk about an ecological desert right here. Um, we got three different types of rock on the picture on the left, um, contrasting, I guess. Um, imagine the, the um, erosion issues coming down in this valley because more than likely that's got black plastic underneath it that's allowing that water to shoot off. Um, this is a pretty slanted road here too. This is my house when we first bought it. Um, a good lawn alternative is the fescue annual rye and micro clover. Uh, this is our house. Uh, so that's the house here on the right. A um, lot of rock, some liriope in there. Uh, so, um, Fescue annual rye um, is great in the spring. Um, and in the summer, they typically die back down. Um, so in the summer and the fall, gets a little less lime green. It's crazy how I didn't realize how green that would be. Um, and it, you know, most of that clover um, goes to, you know, you know, the, or I'm sorry, the rye tends to die down. I, you can overseed easily in the fall. I just haven't. I like the micro clover too much. Um, lawn alternatives, um, just a simple reduction. The more ecological, more adaptable, reduce water and nutrients require less mowing. So this is a, um, this is a moss lawn in my backyard. Easy to encourage. Um, love, love, love buffalo grass. This is taking it Thaden. Uh, this one's legacy, um, makes a really nice lawn, um, spreads by uh, above ground stolen or underground rhizomes. Um, easy to take a string trimmer and just trim that up and give it a nice edge. Here's a picture of it if you're wondering how my boots looked on a buffalo grass lawn. Uh, lawn alternatives, uh, uh, Dutch white clover. I love clover. I don't see any issue with it. It fixes nitrogen. So that uh, fertilizes your soil right there. Um, flowers, one of the earlier things to flower. So the honeybees and all the other pollinators, that's something really early. <clears throat> I sprinkle it in in our Bermuda grass here at Thaden. I think it looks nice. And here's a picture of just straight micro clover. Um, so that's what I've got in my house. Although I, I, uh, I do that fescue annual and annual rye, add that to it. But um, makes for a nice, nice lawn. Uh, micro prairies. This the prairie here is about 50 square feet, pretty small. Freedom lawn. So if that's a new term to you, that's just anything that grows underneath the mower blade. You know, we want to set our mower blades kind of high, three inches for a cut, about an inch and a half if you have an athletic field. Um, and um, this is a great, great freedom lawn and. Uh, 8th Street in Bentonville. That's all spring beauties. It's a really wonderful native plant. Uh, different variations, pink and white and smaller. This is my son blowing dandelions to make sure you all have dandelions at your house. In conclusion, first we want <clears throat> to do no harm. So how we garden has a direct immediate impact on uh, uh, each in ecosystem in us. It's important to us to, to decide whether these impacts are positive or negative. Build healthy soil, reduce overall inputs, eliminate synthetic herbicides and pesticides, and reduce the Great American Lawn. Um, just real quick side note, the erosion control blanket with, um, with uh, uh, nylon netting. I've, this is a snake. I've, it, one, it blows, blows away and it looks terrible, it just sort of bunched up. But two, it, it, it captures uh, wildlife in it. It's really, really bad. Anyway, so that's one, that's a, 
that's a my bad right there. That I did, I put it down. I didn't really realize it. And as soon as it started looking ugly, I started taking it up and sort of catching. Uh, that's, I found one snake and one frog in there. So anyway, um, Eric, sorry, I, I hope I didn't go too far over time there. Um, no, no, yeah, that was great. Um, I think several other talks have gone a little bit over, so that's okay. no problem at all. Uh, all right, great. So we, we definitely appreciate you, Cody. That was a <laughs> wonderful presentation. I know I learned quite a bit. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in on the chat feature. Uh, if anyone has any others, feel free to go ahead and enter those uh, into the chat. Um, Barb Winger wanted to know if, uh, Cody, did you bring soil into your yard? I'm assuming that's asking about the transition from a rock yard to. Yeah, so yeah, sure did. Um, you know, um, after taking off the, the plastic and the, and the pea gravel, um, the, the soil was it really, really, it was construction soil. So if you know that really dense red clay dirt, um, it had some native soil in there. Um, yeah, so um, it was definitely an input that I had to bring in. Um, but yeah, it was used um, and uh, found some good um, local compost, um, scratched that in uh, with, uh, you know, with like a pitchfork and then, um, you know, either planted the, the garden or I seeded with the, with the, uh, with the seed there. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Maud Humer, uh, or Huber was wondering, uh, how can you get nut sedge out of an asparagus bed? <laughs> yeah, I guess they both kind of like the moist conditions there. Um, so you would have to be pretty tricky with it, I guess, you know, um, if you're irrigating it, I would immediately cut off the irrigation, which you probably would this time of year anyhow. Um, and then, um, you know, I would probably um, either hand remove it or, um, you know, just, just cut it. Um, try to draw down its, uh, its root energy um, after a couple of years. Um, I know that doesn't sound very, <laughs> very time efficient, but after a couple of years, it, it, it would work. Um, I'm surprised that asparagus hasn't uh, sort of choked it out, but, um, but yeah, um, patience with it for sure. Um, and uh, just eliminate its cultural requirements. So if it's getting a lot of water, try to eliminate, try to eliminate that. All right, uh, let's see. Got one other question just popped up here. Yep. from Val. Uh, Val has a large prairie plant collection, but also quite a few oak trees. Would you say that they should not use their oak leaves to mulch in the planting areas? Uh, prairie, I'm re oh, I'm reading it here too. Yeah, yeah I probably wouldn't. Um, now, I mean, if you think uh, evolution-wise, I don't know if you planted the, the prairie uh, plants amongst the the oak trees um but you know it if it's more of a savanna um you know like a like an oak or hickory savanna um that would um it, it, i don't know it just depends on the plants if it's something typical like like your coneflowers or something that requires a lot of sun hot dry i'd probably not do it but if it's something that you didn't plant and it's just evolved in that. Um, I still probably wouldn't do heavy with the leaf mulch, but I would, you know, mulch mow it over it and, you know, use your clippings and as that as, as the mulch. So I don't know if that helps uh, with anything, but um, yeah, I guess it would, I would say, depending on the plant species that are underneath it. Oh, there, there are areas. Prairie plants are not under the trees. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I wouldn't use leaf mulch on prairie plants. Um, you know, if the, um, especially if it was there and you planted the, um, uh, if you planted the oaks, then yeah, they weren't evolved with that. So I would, I would, uh, hesitate, you know, I'd probably just use, um, ship 
oak leaf. Um, I don't think I would ship it off. That's, that's your, your, um, you're putting out a lot of inputs there. If you have a way of um, like, usually what I do, I have a lot of leaves at my house. I just have a corner that each year I either rake or, you know, I, I, I blow it into a corner um, and I let that leaf pile decompose. It creates leaf mold. Um, that's a great soil amendment for something else that's more appropriate. Um, plus you're, you're getting rid of a lot of microorganisms um, or, or, you know, not, well, not so much micros as you are like uh, cocoons and larva fireflies, that sort of thing. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, Phyllis Stair uh, has two questions. First one is what is girdling? What does that mean? Uh, and then oh, sorry. Second, yeah. I'll, go, I'll let you answer that one, then I'll ask, I'll ask the second one. Okay, uh, girdling is when, um, um, like you see uh, roots tend to girdle. So it's, you're, you're basically choking something. And like when you, if you have a tree that you wanna girdle so you can kill it, uh, you're taking a saw, a chainsaw, and you're making an inch, um, you know, uh, cut about, you know, you wanna make sure you're going um, through the, you know, the. You know, you don't want to get to the heartwood, but you want to um, you want to make a pretty good, pretty deep scar all the way around it to make and do a couple of them right underneath it, uh, and that's going to make sure that the nutrients aren't being uh, translocated throughout the tree. So that'll kill it pretty pretty quick. And Phyllis also asked, where do you get your organic herbicide? So Arbico Organics is a really good. Um, uh, organic supplier of a lot of things, but I've, a vendor, I got it off for Arbico Organic. I think it's A-R-B-I-C-O, Arbico. I think they're out of Arizona. Um, and then um, the Green Gobbler, if you just Google Green Gobbler, I got it straight from the supplier because uh, I get a 50 gallon uh, drum of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I know they sell it in much smaller quantity. You don't have to get a 50 gallon drum of it, but yeah. And Val, uh, back to Val's question about the leaves. Uh, Val was asking, so would you not use composted leaves there either? I'm assuming um, on the prairie plants. On the prairie plants, yeah, I would still discourage composted leaves. I would, I would encourage you to, to, to mulch mow or if you, if you got a mower, I. I got a battery powered one from, uh, from Walmart this year, but, um, and it's worked really great. Um, and you can, you could just mulch the cutting. So if it's grasses or if it's seed heads or whatever, just run that over a couple of times and that stuff breaks down, you know, really easily. So, um, that's going to be more along the lines of, again, I don't know what species are there, but if they are prairie plants, they would have evolved with that rather than, you know, uh, for an, an annual application of, you know, leaves defoliating. Um, so you, you could run the risk of a couple things. If you put the composted leaves, um, well, if they're composted leaves, you probably just make the soil too rich because prairie, most prairie plants like, like a lean soil, you know, rocky or, or, um, uh, you know, hot, dry, that sort of thing. You know, mulch mow asters and I don't say asters. And, oh, grass. For, that's a very good point. So um, some of the taller grasses that we have here, um, if you got a string trimmer, um, I would take those down uh, with the string trimmer and then run it. Oh, and goldenrod. Yeah. <laughs> And then um, I would use your mulch mower to uh, mulch that material back into it. But yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. You know, a foot is something different than four to five foot. So I would use that if you don't want, I mean, you don't even have to, to do that. You could, you know, trim that material down if you want to, you know, locate it at a corner of your property, let that decompose and just use that as compost, you know, the next year or something. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't necessarily have, if you just want to um, leave it, I mean, those plants are 
you know, more than capable of, if you just leave everything alone, they'll come up just as fine. And plus you're not removing any sort of material. Yeah, exactly. Yep. You could, you cut that material 12 to 15 inches high and leave it, um, for the, for the bees to nest in. Exactly. Yep. All right. Are there any other questions? Well, Cody, we really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise with us. Uh, yeah, really, really appreciate this. This is a wonderful presentation. Looks like we've gotten a lot of great feedback in the chat feature also. Great. I want to thank everyone again for being here today. Again, this recording will be made available. I'm going to uh, post it onto our Ozark Wild Ones YouTube channel. And also all the registrants will get a link to the Zoom video as well. Uh, we're planning another webinar series in the spring, so if you want to catch that, you can reach out to us on Facebook or by email at wildonesozarkchapter at gmail.com or facebook.com slash ozarkwildones. And if you're interested in joining our group, uh, go to wildones.org slash membership. And like I said at the beginning of this presentation, you can join for as low as $25 a year. Uh, so... Again, Cody, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Hope uh, we can get you back for another webinar, maybe in the spring or the fall next year. All right, Eric. Happy to. Thanks, man. Have a good one. You too. Bye.